Hey guys. Hey, how'd you how'd you do this week? Did you have a good week? Um, did it rain? Yeah, it kind of rained, didn't it? But we had a lot of sunshine. Um, I hope y'all were outside and was getting some sun. But you wore sunscreen. Make sure you wear sunscreen and a hat if you have a hat. Um, what do you what do you think about my lights? Do you like them? Like I bought these today at the store. Red, white, and blue. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? Yeah. Red, white, and blue. What do you think? Yeah. And look, I can make them flash really fast. Can make them flash slow. And I can make them just stay put. Do you know why the stores have red, white, and blue stuff? Do you know why that is? Well, I had to look at my calendar, but on Saturday is July 4th. See that? July 4th, 1776. That is the Declaration of Independence. 1776. It's 2020. That is a long time ago. Really old. That's older than me. It's older than Darren Telford. Do you know Darren? Next time you are in church, you ask Darren if he is older than 1776. Yeah. Um, so the Declaration of Independence was signed then and that gave us freedom. Like we can worship whoever we want to. We can, you know, have freedom of speech. Um, you know, freedom to do what we want to do. We, nobody can tell us. Well, your mom and dad can tell you. And your teachers can tell you. Well, and the police officer can tell you. But otherwise, you know, we can, we can do what we want, right? Um, does that make sense? Maybe mom and dad can explain it to you. But, so, I thought, what else is there about July 4? Well, there's fireworks, there's probably camping, there is sparklers. I don't have any sparklers. I went to go get some and um, the ball game got over late, so I don't have any sparklers, but I hope you find sparklers. They're safe. Make sure though that when the light gets down to, you know, about here, you want to let go and give it back to mom and dad. Um, but you be very careful around fireworks in your yard. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, you probably grill out. Um, I don't, I don't know. Maybe you'll see some friends. Maybe go for a bike ride. Um, enjoy the weather. Maybe you'll go fishing. A lot of different things you'll do on July 4th. Anyway, so I, I also looked up a couple of things. You know, I found money. Money. Okay? And, you know, quarters and nickels and dimes and pennies. I found out that when you look at the back of a dollar bill, it says, in God we trust. And when I look at the back of a $5 bill, it says, in God we trust. And when I look at a quarter and a nickel and a penny and a dime, it says, in God we trust. So I looked up and thought, well, I wonder when that became that way. When did they do that? So in 1956, President Eisenhower, can you say that with me? Eisenhower, he signed into law a bill declaring in God we trust to become the nation's official motto. I had no idea. Now maybe my social studies teacher might have told me that. I probably should have listened a little bit more. I didn't know that. And so that happened on the back of those dollar bills and those coins, like that started appearing in 1864. See that? 1864. It's really old. So then I looked up, well, what happened? 
You know, when we say the Pledge of Allegiance, put your hand over your heart and you say the Pledge of Allegiance, what do you say at the end? Under God, indivisible. Well, do you know when that was added? That was added in 1954. President Eisenhower, he added that too. Hmm. So, all of our money has in God we trust. And we say it in the Pledge of Allegiance. We come to church on Sundays. You watch my videos on Sundays and watch Pastor Jason on Sundays. Yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? And every day when you go to Casey's and you get your coffee with your mom or your dad or your grandpa and grandma, you know, in that dollar, it says, in God we trust. And I bet you it's on a $10 bill and a $20 bill. I don't have those bills with me today because I spent them. So this is all I got in my purse. Um, but ask mom and dad if they have those bills and see if it says, in God we trust. I bet it does. You have to look really close. Like I had to put my glasses on to see the quarter. In God we trust. That is really cool. Hmm. So then I looked. I thought, there's got to be a Bible verse out there, right? So I found a Bible verse. And it comes from Psalm 33, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. We believe in God. We read our Bibles, right? We read our Bibles. We handle our money that says, in God we trust. Quarters, when you, you know, go get bubble gum or whatever at the concession stand. That all says, in God we trust. July 4th is coming up. So we need to remember that as a nation, we need to know that in God we trust. Yeah, every day. So, go check out your money. See if it says it on all your money in your piggy bank, okay? Go see if you can see those words. And just remember that on July 4th, we celebrate our freedom but we also remember that our nation, when we declare God is our Lord, that we will receive inheritance from God. And you know what that inheritance is? It's heaven. Heaven. Yeah. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. So, I want you to be very, very careful this weekend um, when you're doing fireworks or sparklers or whatever, um, grilling out. Um, I hope that you have a great holiday weekend and um, that you guys are all safe. So let's go ahead and say a prayer, okay? All right, fold your hands, close your eyes. Dear God, thank you for giving us the day July 4th that we may have our independence in the United States. Let us know, let us remind ourselves Every time we touch a quarter or a dollar bill and we go and we spend that money at the concession stand or at Casey's, that in God we trust is on that money and that we should always know who you are. Help us to tell everyone about you and that we are safe while we light off our fireworks and our sparklers. Thank you for our food, the clothes on our back, and the homes that we live in. Thank you for our families and our moms and our dads. Thank you for our church family, and please bless over the school and the adults that are making some decisions about us to go back to school in the fall. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll see you later. Have a great week. I'll see you next Sunday. Bye-bye.
From the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I spent a lot of years doing improv in college and after that. Improv is the style of theater where everything is made up on the spot with just a suggestion from the audience. Plot, story, characters, dialogue, everything made up in the moment. You're not supposed to plan anything before you walk out on stage about the story or your character. It's got to be made up on the spot. When you see improv done really well, it looks easy. People are just talking. When you try it, it's actually very difficult. Sometimes I did okay. Sometimes I failed miserably. It's tough to make up a whole story, a whole play or theatrical moment on the spot one Sunday afternoon during class, my teacher, this older, grumpy, very humorless man, pulled me aside on a day when it didn't seem like I could do anything right, and he said, how are you feeling today? I said, kind of worthless. He said, great, next time you walk out on stage, no matter what happens, that's how you feel inside. I asked, isn't that cheating? Isn't that kind of pre-planning to figure out what emotion I'm going to have? He said, nope, that's life. Every time you walk in a room, you already have an emotion inside you, and it should affect everything you do when you walk in the room. It was good advice, not just for improv, but for life. Every time you walk in a room, your emotion, what you carry inside of you, will affect everything that happens to you in that room. I've seen people who have a sign on the door of their house that says, leave it at work. They'd had an issue coming home with lots of work stress, and then it carried over into family life. The sign was a little reminder that they should leave work stress at the door and enter the house in family mode. Our scripture today from Ephesians talks about getting prepared for what the world might throw at us. It talks about God's spirit facing off against flesh and blood, dark powers and authorities. It uses the imagery of armor as if preparing for war. But instead of physical weapons to face the evils of the world, the armor that God outfits us with is all spiritual. Truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, the word. The Ephesians passage is a whole sermon series unto itself, but what's interesting to note in light of our current series on peace is verse 15. Our feet should be readied and outfitted with the gospel of peace. I don't think that's a coincidence. Our feet, which get us from point A to point B, should at all times be ready to deliver not just the gospel, but the gospel of peace. We are to travel with peace always with us. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. That whole passage from Ephesians is such a crazy metaphor. Prepare yourself for war. Get all armored up. There is darkness and evil waiting just outside. And when you get to the battle, you bring with you truth, righteousness, faith, salvation, the word. You bring peace. I listened to a podcast a few years ago where people from all different walks of life talked about what they did for a living. There were bus drivers and short order cooks and salmon farmers and... One week, the guy talking was a SWAT team negotiator, someone they call in for standoffs or hostage negotiations. It sounded like an incredibly stressful job, 
Someone is holed up in a house or another building refusing to come out and threatening violence, and you're the person whose job it is to end the confrontation, to talk the person down. He said you have to build up trust with the person you're negotiating with. You have to get to know them. You have to find out about their life, find out why they're doing what they're doing, find out what their goal is. Sometimes their goal is just to be heard. He talked about how negotiations could go on for a few hours, but often went on for a few days and sometimes even weeks. He talked about how it's not like what you see in the movies, not exactly. He's not allowed to trade himself for hostages. Yes, sometimes snipers are involved, but if the hostages are there, it's not ideal to try to lure them by a window in case you miss and hit someone who's innocent. In fact, unlike what you see in the movies, he said that there is really only one successful scenario for every negotiation that he's in. Everyone comes out unharmed. Anything less than that in his mind was failure. When he goes in to negotiate with the person who's holed up, he has to see them as a person who is just as valuable as the hostages they might be holding in the situation. If for one second he considers them as less than or expendable, he felt like that would come through in the conversation and the trust he'd built up could be broken. The ultimate goal was always a peaceful resolution. To go into the situation with anything other than peace as the goal was to set yourself up for failure. What you carry with you in your heart or your feet, as is the case in Ephesians, will affect everything around you, wherever you go. From the book of Isaiah, chapter 26. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation, its walls and ramparts. Open the gates that the righteous nations may enter. The nation keeps faith. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. He humbles those who dwell on high. He lays the lofty city low. He levels it to the ground and casts it down to dust. Those who trust in the Lord are told they will have peace. And then you catch the next part. He humbles the high. He lays the lofty low. He levels the ground. He does it, not us. If you research about how to have peace in your life, so much of it is reactive. So much of it has to do with what you do when you're already in turmoil. Take three deep breaths. Count to 10 slowly. Exercise. Go out in nature. Journal about what's bothering you. But with Christianity, having calm and peace is not only about being reactive. It's about being proactive. It's about starting from that place of peace so that you end up in the place of conflict less often. When we take it upon ourselves to bring the lofty low or humble those who need humbling, we miss the important word in the passage. He. That is what he does. That is God's job. Through these last several weeks, we've been reminded again and again that as followers of Christ, we are not to go through the world as everyone else does. We are not called to win at all cost and rule from the top. We are called to humbly submit and to serve. Read that passage from Ephesians again. You'll notice that the only weapon we are given is the word. Everything else is defensive. It even mentions that we are supposed to stand there and take the flaming arrows until they run out. We are not supposed to fight. Following Christ is a sacrifice. We are supposed to offer our bodies and our spirits to the service of God and others. As Ephesians puts it, we're supposed to get all dressed up for war, but deliver peace. Following Christ means sacrifice. At one time, those sacrifices included livestock and worldly possessions that were given up for God to show our love. 
They were even called peace offerings, sacrifices made to show God that we want to stay at peace with his spirit, that he was more important than any possession or comfort that we might have on earth. Christ's sacrifice removed that obligation to sacrifice in the same way. And instead, we are now called, we are now called to sacrifice our hearts and our minds. We are to empty our souls of all that feels good to the world and replace it with truth and love and righteousness and mercy and, yes, peace. What would it mean to consciously enter every room with the mindset of peace? The moment you grab a door handle, you say to yourself, whatever is going on in here today, whether it be home or work or the store, whatever you're walking into, you come bearing the peace of God into any situation. You say to yourself, my mind may try to respond with anger, jealousy, anxiety, frustration, but I know that beneath all of that, I have the peace that God offers through our trust in Him, and that is what I will fall back on. I think it's important to note that while all of our scriptures today tell us that we bring the peace of God with us, it's also something that we leave behind. When you come bearing gifts to a dinner party, you don't pack them all up at the end of the night and take them home. They're gifts. You're leaving them for the host. What do you leave for the places that you visit in your life? What would it mean to bring the peace of God to every room you enter? When we close the service with the words, go in peace, we don't just mean out the door. We mean all the way home. Go in peace to your job. Go in peace to your school. Go in peace to your friends and your family and your enemies and the strangers you meet. And then we pray, you take that peace and bring it back with you next week as well. Go in peace, come in peace, amen.